Hey, welcome to worship here at Fairmont Avenue United Methodist Church. Good morning. I'm Ashton Horsley, Director of Children's Ministries. This Sunday, I'd like to invite all of our young people to grab a friend or a family member, maybe a pet, to play a game and learn just what it means to love like Jesus loves. The children's sermon is posted to Fairmount Avenue United Methodist Church's YouTube channel. Good morning. Welcome to Fairmount Avenue United Methodist Church online worship. I'm Pastor Shauna, and I want to welcome you to worship today. As we gather in the places that we are, I invite you to go online to our website to find this morning's worship guide with hymns and liturgies to assist in this morning's worship. Let us worship together. Please join me in the prayer of invitation. O oh God, in mystery and in silence, you are present in our lives, bringing new life out of destruction, hope out of despair, growth out of difficulty. We thank you that you do not leave us alone, but labor to make us whole. Help us to perceive your unseen hand in the unfolding of our lives and to attend to the gentle guidance of your spirit that we may know the joy you give your people. Amen.
And now won't you please join me in prayer. Holy God, we give thanks for this day. We give thanks for the relief from this week, uh, for the peaceful transition of power in our nation and, and of leadership in our nation. God, we pray for the coming weeks and days as we lean into a new season as, as a nation, uh, that you would fill each of our hearts with a sense of love and care for our neighbor, a desire to, to know you and to live a more excellent way. God, we pray for all who are struggling with the effects of COVID-19. We pray for those who are having financial difficulties. We ask for your relief. For those who are struggling with breath in their bodies and strength in their, in their very being from, from this virus or other illnesses or ailments, God, we pray for your mercy and your healing. For all who are grieving, we pray for your peace. We pray for our schools and our teachers and leaders who are in St. Paul and in many places around our state going back into in-person school. We pray for safety and wellness and for joy for education. And God, we pray today as your son has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Today's reading is from Mark chapter 1, verses 14 through 20. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called to them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. So ends the reading. So Mark's Gospel might be one of my very favorite um, in all of Scripture, and partly because it tells the story of Jesus in such a, a clear and focused way, but also there's all kinds of literary elements happening within Mark's Gospel. Mark's Gospel is also thought to be the oldest of the Gospels, right? It's, um, it's the Gospel that uh, the other Gospel writers, we believe, sample from. Um, that the parts of the Synoptic Gospels that are the same originated from Mark's Gospel. Today's scripture in the Gospel of Mark is right at the beginning, right at the beginning of Jesus's ministry. And, and the reading today comes right after Jesus has been, been called, has been baptized, has been tempted in the wilderness. And of course, these 40 days and 40 nights of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness is, is part of our Lenten journey, right? That we settle into 40 days of journeying through Lent, uh, which is coming quicker than we know it. But today's scripture comes right after that, where Jesus calls his first disciples. It sets the stage that, that John the Baptist, who had been uh, preaching, repent, and believe the kingdom of God is near, has just been taken and uh, thrown into prison. And this is where Jesus picks up the work of growing the kingdom of God. I remember the first time that Jesus asked me to follow him. And I don't know if you remember the first time that, that it really clicked in your brain, in your heart, of what it meant to, to follow Jesus, to make a decision to follow Jesus. And maybe you haven't done that. Maybe in your experience, you've always known who Jesus is and, and you were raised in the church and you don't remember a clear moment where you've decided to follow Jesus. But I'll challenge you on that. That we are asked to follow Jesus many times throughout our lifetime. Today, we can make a decision to follow Jesus. You may have already made a decision to follow Jesus and you can renew that decision to follow Jesus because it is something that we are continually doing. As Wesley said, moving on towards perfection, it's a process. Sanctification is a process. It is sometimes a daily process, decision to follow Jesus. But I remember the first time I decided to follow Jesus. I was, I was a young girl. I was probably about 11 years old and a friend had invited me to church, to the Wednesday program at the church she attended. And, and the lesson that night was, how would you tell your friends about Jesus, how to follow Jesus? And I remember going home that night thinking, I don't know that I ever decided to follow Jesus. I don't know that I ever made a decision to, to know and be in relationship with and to study and, and to uh, dedicate my life and my heart and my mind to a pattern of being connected to God. And so that night I went and I've told this story before, I went and I snuck into my parents' room and I knew that my dad had a Bible in his nightstand and, and I borrowed it uh, without telling him. Um, I don't think he missed it. And I took it in my room, and after my parents tucked me in at night, I started to read the Bible. And I didn't know exactly what to read, but I started with the New Testament, and I started with Matthew's Gospel, because it's the first one in the New Testament. And I just started to read, and, and as I got older, uh, it was probably somewhere in my late 20s, um, that I learned the story about this Bible. The Bible that I had snuck out of my dad's room um, and was reading at night. 
uh, in this effort to follow Jesus and to know the life and teachings of Jesus, this Bible that I was reading was given to my dad when he was preparing to leave for Vietnam by a neighbor, Bert, who had taken an interest in my dad and his siblings and their, their wellness and their well-being. My dad's uh, family growing up had a lot of struggles. Uh, there were eight kids in the household and, and my grandfather struggled to maintain work because of a, a mental health, physical disability that he had. And, and so they really struggled. Uh, in a lot of ways, they struggled. But their neighbor, Bert, took an interest in, interest in those Emerson kids and got them all enrolled in Catholic school. He helped to find scholarships for them to engage in faith. He made sure that they made it to Mass on Sundays. And, and for my dad, it continued later as he, he grew uh, to be a man and a young man, right? Just out of high school when his number was called and, and he was to go serve in Vietnam, he was given this Bible. This Bible that he gave to my dad is the Bible that I picked up and started reading it was the instigator of my faith, of my commitment, my first time of following Jesus. I want you to think about that for a minute. I was able to follow Jesus in a clear, intentional way because a generation before, a man that was the same age as my grandfather followed Jesus, cared for the spiritual well-being of my dad and his siblings, thought enough of following Jesus to give my dad a Bible to take with him to, to Vietnam, and that Bible became the thing that spurred on my faith. That Bible was, was part of God's equipping for my dad, but it was also part of God's equipping for me. This thing that we do sometimes, we make a decision to follow Jesus, and it might seem simple, like buying a Bible for a young man who's about to go off to war, who never signed up to go in the first place, and how that might grow exponentially in this world. Because of his faith, I have faith. And I've been able to be uh, uh, serve in God's ministry and service in three different churches. Think about that for a minute. There's a lot I could say about this scripture, but I want to focus on, on a couple of key things. One, first, following Jesus is hard. It's hard from the start. When I first decided to follow Jesus, I was unsure if it was even an okay thing to do because nobody in my family did it really. And, and so I didn't know how to do that in an out loud kind of public way. And so I, I, I snuck the Bible into my room and I snuck it under my covers and, and I would read it at night after my parents put me to bed. When Jesus started his ministry, John had just been put into prison. It was not an easy road. Following Jesus required courage. It required a, a deep sense of righteousness and, and rightness and passion on Jesus's part to do this work and to lean into this work. Following Jesus requires a deep sense all the way in your bones to your very soul, a passion to follow God into what is good. The second thing uh, I think about when I think about this scripture is that uh, following Jesus becomes your first priority. Now, we have a lot of priorities in our lives these days. Uh, obviously, as a parent, I have children. I have a, as a, a wife, I have a husband. As a, as a pastor, I have a, a faith community. As a neighbor, I have my, my community and my neighborhood. As an individual, I have my own well-being and wellness to attend to. But sometimes following Jesus will ask you, to make that call your first priority. It may ask you to drop everything in order to follow Jesus. This was a story of Simon and Andrew, two fishermen. When Jesus said, come on, let's go, they didn't hesitate. They dropped their nets and they went. 
boldly, with, with passion. They had this deep sense within them. That's the only way you could describe it or, or make sense of it, that they followed Jesus. And what I love about this is that Jesus connects their new calling with their current work, that following Jesus, you will become fishers of men. God had already given them the skills they needed to do the work they were called to do, even though it felt like such a completely different vocation. The last thing I want to offer out of here is that God has already given us what we need to follow. In the incidents of, of the Zebedee brothers, John and James, when Jesus had come follow me, they left their father with the hired men. They already had everything that they needed to be able to make Jesus the first priority, to be able to courageously follow into this bold work. And church, I want to take a moment to just acknowledge that God continues to be faithful to our community. When we stay the course to follow Jesus into our calling, we see God's provision every step of the way. We ended 2020 in a year that was such a strange year. We ended the financial year, the fiscal year, about even, even slightly in the positive. I want you to think about that for a minute. The generosity of our community sustained the work of this church all the way through the year. Our pledges for the coming year, for 2021, are up 13%. Now, that's a, a, a tricky thing to, to figure because there's also people who have become new pledgers, right, that never pledged before. Um, but what this means is and what it indicates is that we have courageously decided as a community that we are going to commit to following Jesus into 2021 with boldness. Understanding that God is giving us what we need to do the work we're called to do. And for as hard as 2020 was, we know that God gave us so many good and beautiful things. 12 new members, the Joint Church Anti-Racism Ministry Vacation Bible School, right, that reached across our country. We have given thousands of pounds to Keystone Community Services. We have six new young people in confirmation this year. We started new small groups and, and through all of this, I want you to hear this, not one person, as far as we know, contracted COVID-19 from the practice of their faith through Fairmount Avenue United Methodist Church. This bold vision, when we follow, when we, we prioritize our, our following of Jesus into this world, of meeting the call to build God's vision in this world. God gives us what we need to do it over and over and over again. In today's scripture, John had just been thrown into jail and, and Jesus's cousin, right? John, Jesus's cousin was thrown into jail for preaching the good news that God's vision was near. It was not an easy time then, it's not an easy time now. But Jesus maintained God's vision and Simon and Andrew and James and John followed confidently, courageously, prioritizing that work. As we look into this year, I am convinced that God has given us what we need to do God's work, to fulfill God's call, both in our, our resources, our, 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 our physical resources and our people resources, but also in our passion for this work. And we can start to ask questions about what it means to live into 2021. Asking ourselves how we might we engage or, or relate to our building differently when we're able to come back. How can we keep the best of what we have gained in this distance church model and, and rediscover what we have missed and, and bring it all back together faithfully, not just for worship, but for our entire faith practice, creating and building a new thing. When Jesus called the disciples fishermen instead of scholars, working class instead of the educated, building a new way to be in relationship with God outside of the temple. Jesus did not rush back into that temple or the synagogue and take it over. Instead, Jesus brought the practice of faith to the lakeshore, to the living rooms, 
to the gathering places, to the hillsides, into the world. When we come back together in person, we will and we must follow Jesus into this new way of being church. We are a changed people. This, this pandemic has changed our world and, and we do a disservice to the work God has done in us and through us if we simply come back and do things the way that they were instead of leaning into and acknowledging the ways in which God has made us new. We must ask ourselves, for what purpose have I maintained my faith through this pandemic? For what purpose has our, our church been made stronger through this pandemic? And then we must ask ourselves, do we have the courage to press into this new thing like Jesus did after John was arrested? Do we have the vision to, to drop everything when Jesus says follow? Do we have the faith to trust that God has, has already given us what we need to live into God's bold vision for this world? Come, follow me. Jesus is calling us, church, into this new year, this new season. As we wait, as we embrace, as we pray about what's next, follow me, Jesus says. Jesus watched them from afar and called them each by name. It changed their lives, these simple men, they'd never be the same. Leave all things you have and come and follow me, and come and follow me. He walked along the shore, twas James and John he'd find, and those two sons of Zebedee would leave their boats behind. Their work and all they held so dear, they laughed. So now, as you go into your day and your week, 
May you be filled and strengthened by the Holy Spirit. Receive now the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. Go in peace, everybody.